Well, thank you so uh, so much. I'm I'm Raquel Iceras, and and I'm going to present uh, a paper on I call it narratives of the forgotten, that because I thought it was very phil philosophical, and it was basically a sort of gender approach uh, to the Iberian Iron Age meseta in the meseta into the Iron Age. So we have been on this session traveling around the, the Iberian Peninsula. So now we are going to go to the center of the meseta. No? We have been in the east, we have been in the west. Now we go to the center. Well, first of all, I would like to present you the region so everybody knows where and when are we located. So as you can see, this, this uh, area is a uh, is an area into the northern plateau of Iberia. It's an area that the Greco-Roman authors call Celt Iberia. And the time frame basically is the late Iron Age, which roughly in this area covers the, between the fourth and from the fourth century till the second century BCE. And now that we know where we are, let's start with the, with the gender and the androcentric uh, images. So first of all, I would like to discuss in this session, what image have we built up uh, of the Caltaverian people? And you can see here, I think I've done a good selection. I don't know, Manuel, what do you think? Yes, pretty good. And, and I, was want, I, was, I want to ponder uh, what all these representations have in common. I think two things. First, violence is at the heart of the activities of these people, as you can see in our reconstructions. And secondly, all the scenes are played by men. So women do not appear even in, you know, in secondary position at the, at the back of the scene. No, they are not. We, we are not talking about children or elders. So they are not at all in this sort of societies. So I wanted to, to, to wonder why is this happening or why this is happening. Basically, I will, I will say that one of, probably one of the main causes is basically that research has focused on androcentric narratives. So partially, they are, I understand that they can be promoted by the text of Greco-Roman authors, uh, because Greco-Roman authors have constructed narratives about uh, basically to justify the conquest of Iberia. And I think from research, we have taken these narratives and we have try to study just the male that appear there. And this is a problem because not all males are in these narratives. They are only the males from the elites, the males from the ruling classes. They are not all men either. So, and with these male-centered uh, discourses, uh, in research we have encouraged certain narratives in which it's particularly easy to see this, uh, this ruling classes men, men, no? Which are then basically violence, the, the, the role of violence, war, role of mercenaries, or for instance, the urbanism in the role that played the ruling classes into the urbanism. And also we have uh, researched a lot about certain artifacts such as weapons or ornaments, or we have studied the iconography in, in pottery. And, leave, and let me give you a, a taste of this because uh, in this area, so pottery, the, the iconography is basically masculine. Uh, I think, again, I've done a sort of compilation in which we can see the, that most uh, figures uh, human figures are males, they are in different uh, attitudes, they are in, in confrontation, in the vessel of warriors, they are like training horses or they are conducting sacrifices. Uh, we have there in, the, in that corner a uh, guy sacrificing uh, basically an animal or they are dancing again in these sort of rituals or they are severed heads or they are basically fallen in a combat. These are the most frequent ones However, we have a couple of representations that are in all the iconography, there are only two representations of, of women. Uh, the first is uh, a painting on a pottery, and the second one is a pottery figure. And the gender of both of these uh, representations has been questioned. Uh, it's uh, something similar to what happened to the tomb of Bix in France, or what happened to the Lady of Batha in the uh, East Iberia. Um, it's been said that probably the, the breast, what it should be the breast, it was basically ornaments for the clothes. So imagine that. And basically my point is that the male gender of the other representations have never been under discussion. And here it has been. 
just that. So other of the problems we have is that we don't have, in this area, we don't have almost, we don't have domestic context. Basically, till 2010, there were just uh, mostly partial excavations. So basically, all the publication just focused on if the um, structure of the house was uh, circular, or was a square, or was a rectangle. Basically, that, that was the discussion. So we were leaving aside all the social dimension of the, of the household. Um, if we look for publications on women, uh, we just have a few. Look, the, our pioneer talking about women in the region is basically Lourdes Prados that uh, Anastasia told about her as well uh, in 2011. So look how late this started. Then in 2020, we, we had to wait to 2020 to somebody ask what happened with the other middle half of the Iron Age. Uh, I myself, I, um, I, I've done uh, three papers on that as well. And also in the Pintia team led by uh, Carlos Sanzminguez also has published some uh, burials in which they found basically women. Uh, years ago, I was wondering, I was debating these things with a couple of friends, uh, Alba Comino from the EA University, Patricia Murrieta Flores from Lancaster University, and we were talking about these topics and we wanted to try to see the inequality in research but in numbers. So we, we took a, a um, volume, a, a publication, which is the Monumental Catalog of Spain. This is basically a super large compilation of archaeological materials and interpretation of archaeology, but when archaeology was uh, basically um, was involved in, in the, professionalization of, the professionalization of archaeology was starting in, our, in, in Spain. Now it was basically the very early uh, 20th century. And our aim was trying to know how many um, references of women and men was in this, in this corpus and also how they were mentioned and in which context. For our not surprise, uh, we took uh, three um, three provinces, which in Spain are basically like the counties here here in the UK, and we analyzed these three these three catalogs. So, in Avila and Burgos, which are, which are on 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 the, on the more or less the Celtic area, more or less. So, Panje, don't listen to me too much here. So. Uh, basically, in Avila, Avila, the, the volume of Avila has three books. Uh, uh, Burgos has eight books. There are, as you can see, no mention of women at all. And in Soria, we have some mentions. There are seven books for Soria uh, catalog. There are some mentions. Yes, they appear, but they appear in a lower frequency and also in a low, less variety of terms to mention them. So when we finished this, the question was, okay, but we guess it should be some women around in, in the late Iron Age here. So yes, actually, if we look at the uh, textual evidence or the material evidence, women are there or other identities are there. So what happened? In, it's true that uh, most of the writings of Greco-Roman authors focus on the colonial world, but there are some references, references about women, and they are related to their appearance or the activities or collective practices. For instance, women are mentioned as keepers of the memory, responsible for passing the wisdom and the history of the community through generations. The classical authors also refer to the uh, marriage customs where women could choose their husband among the, the, the men considered the bravest. Uh, also, these authors tell us that women were the managers of the houses and they cultivated the land, similar to what Lucia, oh, Lucia, sorry, Sylvia just presented. In addition, we know that women acted as uh, instigators uh, into the uh, Opida assemblies in favor to continue the war against Rome and also fight it again, uh, alongside the men when the confrontation reached their doorsteps. So yes, in the, we have them in the, in the textual uh, references. As we have been debating in all the session, we, we reached the funerary evidence, no? We, apparently everything is clear here, but no, we have seen it. And in the funerary evidence, we have cremations. All of us know what problems cremation have. Has, um, uh, 
So what we have done through decades, even sometimes currently, is basically say, okay, pretty things in a grave goods. Lovely. It's a, ma a woman. So we have weapons or horse-related artifacts. Lovely. Men. Perfect. So what's the problem here? So since, um, 19, the, the, since 1980s, we osteological analysis began to express and provide some scientific basis to at least um, have a um, new dimension to explore uh, gender identities in this sense. And the thing is that even since most of this publication, most of these analyses were published in 1980s, super early in that decade, they, the results have not permeated to the dominant discourse at all. And that's a, this is a, well, this is a problem in many, many, uh, in many, many aspects. For instance, if we look at uh, mortality patterns, if, if we have this analysis, we can go a bit further. So we have discussed a bit about childhood and what happened in, in cemeteries. And of course, in this area, the traditional point of view is that the oh, no, no, the children were just buried under the floor of the houses or in very, very close surrounding of the household. What happened when you look at the analysis published in uh, 1980, it happened that childs were at the cemeteries in the same way that adults, but from that they are basically fetus zero years old till 80 years old. With That's the spam that it's been identified. So most of the... Kids are related, or the the highest uh, the the highest infant mortality is more or less until until weaning is more what well, uh, most authors have said. In the case of adults, we have uh, uh, female mortality, which rise considerably in their twenties, thirties, probably related with. Um, with fertility or possibly pregnancy, childbirth or breastfeeding. And in the case of men, men uh, the average age is slightly uh, higher. Now it's between 30, 40, more or less. Great. Now we have the sex analysis. And now we are going to uh, cross that analysis with, uh, with the grave goods. And yes, sometimes it happened that the gender stereotypes met the, 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 the results, no? the, the osteological analysis. And we can see here two examples from Caratierme's um, cemetery. And yes, we have the, a, a lady, 20, 30 years old, with an amazing pendant, a lot of bracelets, uh, some uh, belt. Uh, pieces or clothes ornaments. And yeah, we have a male here with two spears, a knife, uh, some horse harnesses, a brooch, and also a handle of, um, of a shield. No, yes, sometimes it happened, but what happened in the Meseta cemeteries? That the semiotic of the grave goods is not what we usually have said. So, we can observe how weapons, horse-related artifacts, and ornaments are not related to gender or age identities at all, <laughs> uh, as traditionally considered. Uh, they are related to personal, sometimes, and mostly to family prestige. Uh, so we need, and, and we always need to remember something that Anastasia has pointed out much better than me, that relatives are usually who buried the deceased. So the performance is not what the deceased wanted or uh, embodied their, um, the deceased uh, identities. And for this reason, examples like this uh, are more, I don't know, take another dimension. No? We can see a Sakith that was between, who was between uh, three, four years old, was buried with this amazing um, grave goods related with basically weapons. We can see the two spears. On the top, we can see another sort of a spear that is typical from the uh, East Iberia. It's not typical from this region and also the horse harnesses. And yeah, sorry, I couldn't resist to put here the two siblings that have between zero and years old with all the gaming pieces. So, because it's very cute. Uh, we also have uh, examples like this one that the day that I saw this, uh, trying to make sense to what happened with Karatirme's uh, um, cemetery, I was just amazed, no? Because we have two ladies that were between 50 and 60 years old and they have this amazing weapons, uh, goods that are not usual or nobody has related usually with them. 
Um, living aside the cemeteries, we can go just dig a bit on the domestic spaces, uh, which is a very lovely place to find different identities to the male warriors. Uh, it is bah, the household, no? And especially we can find them through what Alba was saying, the maintenance activities. And I wanted to use the uh, maintenance activities definition that the past women group has, has said, but Alba has defined it so well, so I'm not going to stop there. So these activities, as we have seen, are, are focused on care, and el de su and the support of the emotional ties of the community, as well as the production of the reproduction of social models and values. Although maintenance activities probably is one of the most important activities in a society, I'm going to um, I'm going to speak a bit about domestic spaces and domestic production because I wanted to show you two examples. Uh, first of them is related to textile production, uh, because in this region there is a short of uh, wood, capes and blankets that in, in the classical sources they were called saga or sagum in singular, and they were they, they serve as bargaining chip in the peace negotiation in the wars against Rome. And just to give you an idea of the production capacity of these uh, domestic units, opidas such as Numantia or such as Tiermes have to deliver more than 9,000 saga when signing a truce in 141 BCE. And this is relevant because they have to deliver 9,000 saga, some opidas that have a maximum, maximum um, population of 1,000. 1,500, that is a super maximum. So the, the production capacity was pretty high. Uh, also, another uh, domestic production super relevant in this context is basically Kaelia production. We were talking later about wine production, no? but now I, I bring a... Um, sorry, I always pronounce wrong, wheat, uh, wheat beer, no? a wheat beer which is Kaelia. Um, Kaelia was used by Celtiberians in ceremonial and ritual contexts. Generally, it is linked to war and masculine prestige. Uh, however, the elaboration of this brew was carried out by women in the context of the house. And we have plenty uh, anthropological examples for this sort of production. And Although it was a domestic production, it was consumed in the context of social negotiation where political and social relationships were created, maintained, and strengthened. So in this way, women contributed to the, uh, in this way to the prestige of men, to the prestige of the house, and also of the prestige of all the identities linked to the family. Just to finish, I, in this presentation, I wanted just to give you like a sort of taste of all the of these uh, women that now mm, all, that mostly are uh, so mostly are unforgotten on the on the Iron Age narratives. So uh, we could see all this in this presentation that women played a crucial role in the community's production, reproduction, and social negotiation. Women also held a greater agency that traditionally has been attributed to them. And we could see that from the textual sort of references in which women were referred as guardian of the community memory or household managers, and also in the material culture uh, where women underpin the community emotional ties and their production activities. And just to finish, I wanted to show you a, a reconstruction that it was basically released yesterday in the past women calendar. It was basically funded by one of but by the Body Tales project. And it's basically our excavation of Numantia in, 20, in 2009. And finally, we have a different sort of image of these societies. And that was all by myself. So thank you so much.